Don't you love the truth of that last song we sang? God's love never fails. It never runs out. Do you, do you know that? Do you believe that this morning? God loves you. God loves you. He's mad about you. He's crazy about you. And nothing can separate you from God's love. Even if your team loses, Dave, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Doesn't matter if you had a flat on the way to church this morning and your coffee was cold and you, or you spilled it all over yourself. God loves you. Do you know that? And, and because God loves you, He desperately, desperately wants a relationship with you. God's deepest desire is for you and He to have a relationship, an intimate relationship with you. I mean, think about a friend or a family member, right? Do you have a friend or a family member that you just love to be with? And, and you, could, you can spend all day with them and never get tired of them. You can spend all week. You could vacation with them and never get tired of them, right? Do you have somebody like that? You, you can talk about anything, even politics. You could talk about nothing. You don't even have to talk. And you just enjoy being with them. Listen, listen. For God, that person is you. He just wants to hang out with you. He loves you and wants a relationship with you. I mean, your picture is his home screen on his cell phone. It's his wallpaper on your laptop. It's on his refrigerator. When his cell phone rings, your voice is his ringtone. Your name is on his speed dial. It's the top of his contacts list. God pocket dials you in constantly. God is absolutely crazy about you. That's the message, by the way, of the whole Bible from beginning to end, is how much he loves us and how much he wants a relationship with us. From the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, we're taught that God, creation was designed for God to walk with us and daily and talk with us constantly. And even when we, very quickly in the Bible, even when we, by our sin and rebellion, we pushed back against God he continues to pursue us relentlessly, lovingly, because he just wants a relationship with you. I mean, the whole Bible, the Old Testament, before Jesus shows up, is full of God kind of showing up, burning bushes, dreams, through prophets, the tabernacle, the temple, the Holy of Holies. It was all about God's desire to be with his people to invite them into a relationship with him. And then, and then, the story that most of us are really familiar with, for 33 short years, God himself became one of us. Born as a human baby, raised as a carpenter's son, lived as a Jewish teacher. He lived life with regular people, sleeping, eating, walking, talking, loving, all because of relationship. And then, after 33 years, on the night that Jesus died, well, on that night, he assured us again that out of his deep love and his deep desire to be with us, he wanted nothing more than to be with us. It's his deep desire of his heart, and he made it possible through the gift of his Holy Spirit. Look with me, will you, at that promise. It's in John chapter 14. Uh, the, it's not going to be on the screen, so you're going to have to find it in the Bibles in front of you or with your own Bible or on your phone. If you want to use the Bible in front of you, it's on page 752. 752. We're in a series on the, in the Gospel of John, a series called The New Reality. And in this section of John, from John 13 to 17, it's one long discussion that Jesus is having with his disciples just hours before he's going to die on the cross. And so he's trying to prepare his disciples for his, for his death. He's leaving them, 
And he wants to help them cope with that. They're going to experience more grief and loss than they could ever imagine. They have no idea what's coming. So he's trying to prepare them for that. And so in chapter 14, Jesus introduces some very good news, a new reality. And so he tries to tell his disciples, even though it appears that I'm going away, it's really for your benefit because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he will continue to be with you forever. So as I read, I'm going to start in John 14, beginning with verse 15. John 14, 15. And as I read, listen, note all of the ways that Jesus assures his disciples through his spirit that he will continue to be with them. John 14, 15. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commands and I will ask the Father. And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. But you know him for he lives, get this, he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Anyone who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, And we will get this. We will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken, Jesus said, while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me saying, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what the Father has commanded me. Let me start by talking about this word that we find in both verse 16 and verse um, 25. It's the word advocate. Now, some of your translations may use a different word like counselor or helper It's from a Greek word, and if you grew up in the church and went to Bible study for years, you may have heard this Greek word, paraclete. That's the Greek word. It's a a complex word. It's a word only used in the writings of John, and it's a word without an equivalent in the English English language. That's why it's translated differently in in different Bibles. It's a word that's borrowed from the Greek legal system to describe a legal counselor or one in court who comes alongside and provides counsel and speaks in defense. And I was thinking about the advocate and the word advocate, and I was thinking how grateful I am for humans who serve as advocates for us. And many of you spend your weeks serving as advocates for others, whether it's in a a, a court of law, or some of you are social workers, or patient advocates, or peace officers, and and there are many ways that we are advocates for one another. And I think when we are advocates, when we stand alongside others and on their behalf, we end up reflecting God's heart in many ways. But this word was borrowed from their culture, and then Jesus infuses it with deeper meaning. So when when the scripture uses the word advocate, it's, it's, it's really even more than what a human can do. Certainly, this advocate that Jesus talks about is one who provides counsel and defense. 
But this advocate also provides spiritual resources for comfort and strength and power and knowledge in ways that only God can give, that no human can give. The qualifier here, verse 16, Jesus says, another advocate, that's another clue. That's another clue about its meaning. If another advocate is coming, who is the present advocate for the disciples? Jesus. In fact, John, the writer, uses the word paraclete to, to refer to Jesus in 1 John chapter 2. So Jesus is saying, I have been your advocate, but I'm leaving, but I'm sending another advocate to do for you what I have been doing. The Spirit does for, for us what Jesus did for the disciples. Actually, even better, because he ends up living in us and being a part of us in ways uh, you know, never leaving, never going to the other side of the lake or a mountain where the disciples occasionally had to look for Jesus. We never have to look for the Holy Spirit. He's always with us. So this morning, I'm going to take this chapter and talk about three roles of God's Spirit. And I can't give an exhaustive study of the Holy Spirit. It would take too long. There's much more in the Bible than we have even in this chapter. But from this chapter, let me identify three roles of God's Spirit for us as a reflection of God's deep desire to, 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 be, to know us in relationship. First role of the Spirit is that God, the Spirit is God with us. Now, at Christmas time, we read the passage that says, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. How could they, the disciples, continue to experience God with them? The Holy Spirit. How can we continue to experience God with us? The Holy Spirit. Look at these promises. Look at these promises from the section we read. I mean, aren't those wonderful? Consider the profound nature of this promise. That God, by His Spirit, is with us, will make His home with us. Think about this. In the very beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, before sin entered the picture, God was with humans. He was with Adam and Eve in uninterrupted relationship. It was beautiful. It was perfect fellowship and harmony. This was God's original design. But what happened? Well, our relationship with God was fractured when sin and spiritual death entered the picture. We are then separated from God. But what did Jesus do? Jesus, through his death and resurrection, reconciled us to God. He overcame sin and spiritual death, the things that would separate us from God. And then by his spirit, he is able to restore the relationship that we were intended to have from the very beginning. Sin and death no longer need separate us from God. The spirit is God's offer of returning us to the kind of relationship that humans had with God before sin. We can live in constant fellowship with God because of Jesus' work and because of the gift of the Spirit. Now, the reality that that doesn't happen always in my life is not God's fault. That's my fault. The offer is there to be in constant fellowship, a constant interaction, and constant surrender to God. So when you hear in the Bible, if you're reading the Bible and you come across promises like, I will never leave you nor forsake you, or nothing can separate you from my love, these are all based on Christ's work of bringing us together and on the, the continual presence of God with us by His Spirit. Even, get this, even when we don't feel Him. And I, I don't feel God's presence most of the time. But that doesn't change the truth that He is present even when I can't feel Him, even when I can't hear Him. His promise is true. He is present. Now, let me answer some questions and alleviate some concerns that sometimes arise when we talk about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, how much should we distinguish between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and 
the Spirit. And I'll, like some of you, some of your brains are going to go into like neutral mode here for a minute. You're going to start thinking about the game this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to just be quick. Two or three minutes of theology, and then I'll come back to the practical stuff. So hang with me. You know, should we, should we, should we talk about God's presence with us? Or should we talk about Jesus' presence with us always, right here, right now? Or should we only talk about the Spirit's presence with us? Here's my answer. Relax. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. Give yourself a lot of grace. I mean, look how Jesus talked about it. Jesus didn't really worry too much. He talks about both in the same passage, he says, the Spirit will be with you, and then he says, I will be with you. He says, the Spirit will be in you, and then he says, I will be in you. He says, the Spirit will live with you, and then he says, the Father and I will, will make our home with you. So if Jesus can relax, so can we. You know, we're, we're, we're attempting to use human words in human minds to comprehend the complex mysteries of God. And I think God gives us a lot of grace. I think, I'm convinced that he gives us a lot of grace. So just relax. The same thing has come up. Some of you are in Rooted. A bunch of you have been in Rooted. The question came up, can we pray to the Holy Spirit? Because there was an assignment to write a prayer to the Holy Spirit. Again, should we only pray to God? Should we only pray to Jesus? Can we pray to the Holy Spirit? What's my answer? Relax. Because God is bigger. The ways of attempting to understand all this is bigger than what our finite minds need to write. And I think God just says, I give you my grace. I give you my grace. Just relax. I mean, we're, we're studying the mysteries of God. So when we come to words like the Trinity, the Trinity, anybody here ever heard the word the Trinity? You know, for some of us, that's really intimidating. It's a theological word. It's kind of overwhelming. Here's my summary teaching on the Trinity. The Trinity is a shorthand word, a shorthand statement for all that the Bible teaches us about God, about the relationship between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. It's a very simple human way to try to understand the complex mysteries of God. See, theological terms like Trinity, Incarnation, Deity, you know what they are? They're suitcases. They're suitcases into which we pack everything that the Bible teaches about that complex theological truth. So the Trinity is a suitcase into which we pack everything the Bible says about the relationship between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Kim and I, are, in a few weeks, we're going to leave. We're going to travel to Northern California for an anniversary trip. And, um, you know, we're going to take stuff with us. And we have an option. We could open our trunk and throw in everything that we're going to take separately. Right? Right? Our shoes, socks, pants, shirt, curling irons, makeup. Her curling iron, her makeup, my junk. We could throw it all in the trunk, and it would all get there, right? Or we can pack it all inside of a suitcase, which makes it a lot easier to carry. That's what the word Trinity is. It's simply a suitcase that makes it easy to carry around and talk about everything the Bible teaches about this relationship between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. You see, God reveals himself to us as one yet as a community of three in one nature. There's a diagram that has become um, theologically helpful for people. It's a traditional diagram. Again, diagram is, this is limited. It's, in, it's a limited human attempt to illustrate the Trinity. But look at what it says. God is Father, but that's not all God is. God is bigger than just Father. Jesus is fully God. But Jesus is not all that God is. He's bigger than that. The Spirit is fully God. But the Spirit is not all that God is. He's bigger than that. All three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are fully God, having all the attributes of God. God is one, yet revealed to us in three distinct the theological word is persons. One substance, one God. Interesting, we also learn from Scripture that each member of the Trinity glorifies the other. 
Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father. Glorifies means to point to or to reveal or to honor. It's a beautiful relationship. The other thing that we learned in this passage is that they are in each other. Now, by in, the Father and the Son, the Son and the Father, I don't mean that one is inside of the other. The language is of unity. They are together. They are in unity. What's fascinating, we'll talk about when we get to John 15, is that we are invited to be one with Christ as Jesus, the Son, is with the Father. It's fascinating, so mysterious and beautiful. So, okay, we can come back. Here's the practical point. Here's all that is meant to say this. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is with you, that is in you, is fully God. God is fully present with you and in you. The Spirit is not a lifeline to God. The Spirit is God. You don't need the guardian angel, which, by the way, is a concept not found in Scripture. God has given you Himself even better. Fully God present with you and living in you. And it all comes back to this deep love that God has for you and a desire for you to be in relationship with Him. The second role of the Holy Spirit is that the Spirit is God helping us. Face it, I need help. Amen? That was a little strong. Is that Kim? Yeah, she knows I need lots of help. Let me restate it. We need help, amen? We need help. We were designed by God to live in certain ways, and we cannot live them in our own power. I can't. You can't either. Shouldn't take us long to figure that out. I cannot just grit my teeth, white knuckle it, and attack life on my own. And live the way that God wants me to live. In my own life, I, I am aware of times when I start to drift. I, I'm aware that there are seasons in my life, it's when I get busy, it's when I get anxious, that, that I start to drift away from the power of the Spirit, the power source that God has given me, and I attempt to do things on my own power. I'm getting ready to move into that season in my, my life. In the spring every year, I... Some of you know I host a big banquet and for my ministry. And in that season, I become, I become, if I'm not really careful, I start to rely on my own power. I become short in my, my patience, is, is thin. I get, I'm tempted to be frustrated and angry. And I started to recognize, oh man, oh man, I'm starting to rely on my own power. I need to, I need to lean in to the Spirit's power and surrender again to the, the power that God gives me when he takes up residence in me. It, Jesus says in verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you. Help us what? It's no mistake, it's no coincidence that peppered throughout this passage are these instructions about loving God and obeying his commands. The Spirit is given to us to help us love and Jesus said just prior to this, a new command I give you, love one another. So for simplicity's sake, just say, love God, love one another. Does anybody here ever need help loving God more faithfully or loving another person? Yeah, we do. And see, the Spirit is given to us to help us supernaturally have that ability when God gives us a spirit, it's like this. It's like this. When the spirit comes, it's like, do you remember, do you remember that time that you took the old power source out of your DeLorean and you replaced it with a flux capacitor nuclear reactor to generate 1.21 gigawatts of electricity so you could travel through time? Do you remember that? Oh, wait, that wasn't, that wasn't you? Our original power source is inadequate. See, when we're born, we're given a power source, a human power source that empowers us to do human things. But when we say yes to Jesus, we go into the shop, and he, he doesn't simply do a tune-up. He gives us an entirely new power source. 
that empowers us to live in a whole new dimension, a whole new realm. Now, we can't time travel, but we can do things that supernaturally we couldn't do in our human, with our human power source. We can, it's not about white-knuckling it with our own strength. It's about releasing to God and letting God's power work through us and in us to love, to serve, to care, to be experiencing joy and gentleness and patience and kindness and self-control in ways that we can't do on our own. The great biblical example for me is Peter, right? We love Peter. Peter's impetuous. He puts his foot in his mouth. And, and, and almost all of Peter's life, you know, he's sort of this out-of-control guy because he's running on his own power. Even the night before Jesus dies, he says, you know, I'm, gonna de- I'm determined to stand with Jesus. But what does he do? He denies Jesus three times. Why? Because he's working in his own power. And yet, just a few weeks later, after Pentecost, when the Spirit fills Peter, what does Peter do? The same guy that was afraid of who he would follow, was afraid of Jesus, when he was in a small little circle of people around a fire, now in front of thousands, he's declaring the lordship of Jesus Christ, and he's calling people to repent and come to know Jesus. What changed? His power source. Now the Spirit lives him and empowers him to proclaim and to live boldly. So the Spirit is in us to teach us, to to help us also to teach us. This is my third point. And again, let me go back to Peter. I think Peter, again, is this great example. So the Spirit came into Peter, empowered him with boldness, but we see through the book of Acts there was still something for Peter to learn. The one lesson that we know he learned later was he had to overcome his prejudice. He was prejudiced against Gentiles. And he had to overcome that. God had to teach Peter the truth of God's universal generous love. And so God will do that for us. I still have lessons I have to learn. You still have lessons we have to learn. But we're not alone. I mean, look at these these promises. He's the spirit of truth. He's going to teach us and remind us of everything Jesus said. He will testify about Jesus and guide us into all truth. And you get this? He teaches us, and then he gives us the power to obey his teaching. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And it's a gift to us. From God. Our life, our life in relationship with God, with God's Spirit, is a dynamic process. We're constantly growing, we're constantly surrendering and learning. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, when we say yes to Jesus, we're instantly given the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's an instant gift. But we spend the rest of our lives learning how to live in relationship with the Spirit, how to surrender to the Spirit, and be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5 says, be filled, be continually and regularly filled with the Holy Spirit. It can be a daily prayer, it can be an hourly, it can be a minute by minute prayer. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to take some time, as we said earlier, if you weren't here, we've changed the order here because I want to give some time for us to to really receive, to really respond to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite the worship team back up, and they're going to lead us through some songs of surrender and then a time of prayer. Prayerful surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit. 